Thanks for watching our series on this whole state transfer idea, or what I call stealing your public lands. Uh, the first 14 episodes have been kind of giving you the overview, the history of state lands, and then state-by-state -state explanations. We've got two episodes left, and these episodes are going to focus on who and what is behind the idea of state transfer. And then the last episode is going to be what you, as a public land advocate, can do to protect your public lands, make sure that there's always access to these lands. But before I get into what's behind it, I can tell you what is not behind it. There's nothing in the concept of state transfer, nothing that is going to result in better land management. None of these states can afford to manage these lands and they won't do it any better than the federal government. Just a fact, they're still gonna be subject to the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act. If you believe that litigation is the big concern, the states can't afford that litigation. The states don't have the resources or the manpower to take care of the backlog of roads and all the other things. The states can't manage fire with their limited budgets any different or any better, probably even worse than the federal government. So knowing that better land management is not what drives state transfer, what does drive state transfer? And for me, it's really two issues. One is a real issue, and one is a fake issue, a concocted idea. But I wanna get into the real issue first. There are legitimate frustrations out on the landscape of rural communities whose, the community, the jobs, the businesses, the entire culture has been built around industries that rely on public lands. And when we make changes in our trade policies and we make changes to our land use policies, these people are affected. And I think we, if we want to put out the fire, we go back to what's the source of the fuel that allows the fire of state transfer to burn. And it's that real frustration. I think that's a real issue and it's one we should be focused on. It's one that's going to take a long time to address. The same as managing our land is going to take a long time to address. But those are real issues. Those are real objectives we can focus on. The second issue is the fake issue I talked about, and that's just politicians who never want to let a crisis go to waste. They see there's frustration out on the landscape and they go out there and they sing their songs and they make all these promises. And right now the promise they're making is that somehow state transfer is going to solve all these frustrations on the landscape. It's not. Another huge problem with it is not just how it implements itself and would result in, in us losing access to all these lands, but also the fact that it's taking our eye off the prize. It's distracting our focus when our focus should be on better land management, on long-term sustainability of these lands. The thing that hunters have been known for is generational vision. What happens with state transfer? We have to go and fight these backfires of politicians trying to screw us out of these lands and take all of our energy away from better land management to fighting stupid political battles. We did not get to where we are today in public land management overnight. When it takes 30 years, 40 years to get to where you find yourself, it's gonna take a decade or two to get out of that situation, to change the landscape. And that's where we're at with state transfer, with federal land management. First, we gotta get rid of the dumb idea of state transfer that distracts us from the bigger picture, and then, we have to stay focused on better land management. We have to advocate for proper funding, proper priority, because these lands are extremely valuable economically and culturally. And if we have Congress wanting to continue to act like these lands are some liability to America, it's our job to hold them accountable that these lands are not a liability. These lands are an asset. So when we talk about who, as it relates to state transfer, it gets a little ugly. It gets a little uncomfortable because we have to look in the mirror a little bit. 
I'm gonna start with the easy part. The easy part is who's with us. There's some in Congress who are on our side. There are some in state legislatures who are on our side. There are some of our nonprofit groups that are on our side. Three that come to mind are the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. Those three have probably been the loudest and the most outspoken on the topic. And there have been others who are on our side in the nonprofit hunting groups. There's been a lot of individuals who are on our side. There are business and trade industry associations. Some of you would be surprised to know that the Montana Wood Products Association and other trade industries have come out against state transfer. They are on our side. And now for the ugly part of this discussion. Where the darkness is, is who's against us. And there's a front group called American Lands Council. Everybody knows about them. They go out, they advertise, they promote this entire concept. They, they are ground zero for the, the, I guess, incubation of the idea of state transfer. And if you look at who's funding them, you look at who's advising them, who's involved, you'll see a very colored history going back decades of people who have promoted the idea of selling our public lands. Now they just call it something different, state transfer. But you have to look at a lot of other places to find where the money's coming from, to find who the politicians are who are supporting them. High Country News did a really good piece on it. And there's a map there that shows you on the High Country News website and how many of your counties, your county commissioners, are taking scarce money these counties have and making large donations to the American Land Council. So as much as American Lands Council is the front for all of this, there are a lot of county commissioners, state legislators, and even congressional people who are supporting this. And this is where I know it's gonna piss off a lot of people when I say what I'm about to say. And I'm gonna preface it by saying I've never voted for a Democratic presidential candidate in my life and I don't see that changing this year. But here's the deal. Every bill in every state legislature, every bill in Congress that has been floated around, that has been introduced to try screw you out of your public lands, has an R beside it. In July, last month, the Republican Party held its national convention in Cleveland, and they adopted language that they want to transfer or dispose of the federal lands. Yeah, it's in their party platform. And to make it even more complicated, the Libertarian Party came out this week with a very similar statement, that they are opposed to federal lands, that they want to get the federal lands disposed of. I wish it was different, but the facts are the facts. And this is not a partisan political issue. This is an issue way more important than partisan politics. This is an issue about our history. This is an issue about our culture, our legacy, about our way of life. And I'm not gonna get sucked into a R or D, a left or right team game that somehow I gotta support this side or that side because they have an R or a D. No. I'm a member of the Hunting, Fishing, and Public Access Party. That's the only party I belong to. And if you belong to some other party and you're against us on those issues, I'm gonna kick you in the crotch. And if you're of some other party affiliation and you're with us on those issues, I'm gonna pat you on the back. Just that simple. We have a lot of work to do in educating politicians about what these public lands mean to us. And if anybody can change their minds, it's us. It's the hunters, the anglers, the public land advocates. These lands can't speak up. Those yet unborn cannot speak up. It's really gonna come down to whether or not we speak up. Are we gonna say what needs to be said? Even if it creates some friction, even if it pisses off a few people. Quite honestly, I'm not too worried about hurting someone's feelings if that's what it takes to protect 
and preserve the public lands, the access, and the way of life those lands provide.